Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight in person here at Royal Botanical Gardens Visitor Center for the Rock Garden and also online. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to say hello to uh, people we've been seeing at this important lecture series for many years and also lots of new friends. So my name is David Galbraith. I'm head of science here at Royal Botanical Gardens and it's been my pleasure to uh, kind of serve as the, uh, the programmer for the, the Patrick Colgan Memorial Lecture Series since our first lecture in 2007. This lecture series celebrates the contributions and life of Dr. Patrick Colgan, who was with us at RBG from 2000 to 2004. And uh, so what I'd like to do this evening is just, uh, again, extend my greetings on behalf of uh, the science department staff, our development department, uh, everyone who's been involved in organizing this. We have uh, had amazing technical assistance and organizational help. Uh, from uh, Allison at the back, uh, who will be managing our chat this evening because we have an online audience as well. And uh, so what we're going to do this evening is have a pair of really exciting lecture presentations. Dr. Melissa Lem will be joining us online from British Columbia, live. Wonderful low carbon kind of way of doing a talk. And then Dr. Miles Sargent will uh, follow with his presentation. And then we'll have a, a period of uh, a question and answer both from the folks who are here and also online via the chat function on Zoom. And so Allison will be monitoring the chat and uh, picking up questions that she can relate to our speakers during our question and answer session. So uh, I'd like to begin first by uh, uh, recognizing the long history of First Nations, Métis and Inuit people in the province of Ontario and pay respects this evening to the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the, uh, uh, the keepers of the treaty and rights with the Crown for the lands that Royal Botanical Gardens operates upon. Uh, when uh, European settlers arrived here, uh, we also uh, had uh, the Huron-Wendat Nation in this area. That, that nation is now based uh, further north in Wendake in Quebec City. But this is their traditional territory. And it's the traditional territory for all of those nations because these are people who were living here, who still have connections with the land. Uh, and Royal Botanical Gardens has been very pleased over the past 40 years or so but to be developing a variety of programs with indigenous uh, 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 colleagues and First Nations. Um, and we're looking forward to doing much more of that in the future as well. So uh, what I'd like to do this evening, and hopefully all of the connections are working in the background, uh, first of all is in, to invite our CEO, Nancy Rowland, uh, to join us by Zoom uh, and to say a few words on behalf of RBG and our board to welcome everyone. Uh, so uh, have we got Nancy online? I'm here, David. Here she is. There's our CEO, <laughs> Nancy Rowland. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I'm sorry that I can't be there with you in person this evening, but uh, on behalf of our board of directors, as well as our uh, team of staff and volunteers, I would like to welcome you to the ninth biennial Patrick Colgan Memorial Lecture, uh, lecture this evening. Uh, it's wonderful to once again be able to do this in person um, at the David Braley and Nancy Gordon Rock Garden, but also to be able to uh, participate virtually. Uh, we have a fantastic evening ahead of us with uh, Dr. Melissa Lem and Dr. Miles Sargent as we discuss and explore the connections between health and nature. The series that um, we're um, presenting this evening is really honors a truly amazing man um, whose impact was felt by all uh, who came in contact with him. Uh, as David mentioned, Patrick joined RBG in 2000 as the Director of Research Natu and Natural Lands. It was a newly created position to focus on the management of our nature sanctuaries, our herbarium and library. Prior to joining RBG, Patrick was a biology professor at Queen's University and vice president of research at the Canadian Museum of Nature. His research studying the behavior and biology of fish contributed to his acknowledgement as a world leader in animal behavior. I want to thank Patrick's family and friends, led by Marcia Sweet and Dr. Terry Colgan, who created the Patrick Colgan Memorial Lecture to honor Patrick's memory, but also to share his commitment to science and nature. This evening's presentation is continuing Patrick's commitment 
to communicating science that directly impacts public interest. We thank Patrick's family and friends for making this evening possible. And I wish you a wonderful evening and thank you for joining us. Back to you, David. Thank you very much, Nancy. Uh, this has been really a personal journey for me as well to be a part of the Patrick Colgan Memorial Lecture Series. Because I, know Pat, I knew Patrick long before he came to Royal Botanical Gardens. Um, I did my doctorate at Queen's University between 1987 and 1991. And a portion of the work that I was doing involved behavior. I was particularly interested in uh, how, how snapping turtles in Algonquin Park used space behaviorally and resources and did things like finding mates. And so I found in 1987 uh, this amazing gentleman named Patrick Colgan on my doctoral supervisory committee. Uh, and that was my first experience with Patrick. So I, I, I had that period of several years before he left Queens to join the Canadian Museum of Nature. And uh, he was uh, a mentor and an assist uh, and a friend and uh, an inspiration in terms of the, uh, the intellectual work that Patrick did. But in the midst of being a, a world-leading scientist and an author and an incredible and voracious consumer of books and other things, he always had a magnificent sense of humor as well. And I remember and honor Patrick for that purpose. So uh, I don't want to be up here talking, but I will note that this is, as, as, as you've seen, this is the ninth of these lectures. Uh, what happened after Patrick passed away in 2004 from ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease is that his family came together and with friends, um, put together a fund that supports this lecture series here at RBG. And so what we've tried to do in programming this lecture series is come up with something quite interesting and different each time around. So we've had presentations on the importance of urban biodiversity, on the role of the world's most common street tree, ginkgo biloba, uh, in culture as well as biology. Uh, we had a wonderful presentation by another dear friend on the ethnobotany of Ireland going back in 2015. We've had climate change presentations. And last year, we had a wonderful panel discussion among indigenous practitioners of both traditional knowledge and science and how to bridge those things, how we can learn from each other's practices and understandings and do a better job managing nature and ourselves, I hope. So this is a wonderful opportunity to acknowledge that history, as this is already nine of these presentations. That seems impossible, too. Uh, to lead us into our, our presentations this evening, I would like to call on Dr. Terry Colgan to come up and say a few words on behalf of, of himself and the family. Uh, Terry is Patrick's brother. Terry, please. Thanks very much, David. Uh, you've heard uh, just now the topics that have, been go have gone previously, and they conform largely to the stated missions of Royal Botanical Gardens with respect to horticulture, conservation, science, and education. And our family uh, supports the lectureship and has been delighted uh, to listen and learn from these wide variety of topics. The mental health of Canadians, or lack of it, is a frequent news item. Although the evidence is conflicting whether mental health of our population has deteriorated over the last three years, there does seem to be a consensus that there are too few resources available to support mental health. The Gardens has a history of developing and offering programs aiming to improve well-being. Indeed, during the pandemic, there is a significant increase in the use of the gardens trails. Research initiatives exploring the possible role of the gardens in supporting specific groups are underway. This evening, we have an opportunity to learn from others who have developed methods or programs to encourage the treading of our nature's trails to improve mental health. Our family hopes that this evening will offer potential new paths for the gardens to further develop programs and community partnerships. Thank you for coming to this evening.
Thank you, Terry. And uh, I'd uh, invite anyone who wants to, uh, after our presentations this evening, if you're around to uh, come up and, and meet the family as well. Uh, they've been to all these presentations, uh, sometimes some, sometimes others, but it's just whomever is available, of course. But uh, this support and this ongoing involvement, I think is a real highlight in my view about the way RBG can interact with communities, build support, and, um, and in this case, honor an, an amazing legacy. So I'm wondering to our technical folks in the back, can we bring up uh, Dr. Lem? Is Melissa online? Hello, Melissa. Uh, so we're going to, I'm going to introduce you if that's okay. That's perfect. Great, Thanks, thank Dr. you. Albright. So Dr. Melissa Lem is joining us from Vancouver this evening. She's a family physician and founder and director of Parks Canada's National Prescription Program for Nature, uh, powered by the BC Parks Federation. She's also president-elect of the Canadian Association for Physicians for the Environment, and is an internationally recognized expert on the nature health connection. A senior writer for the CBC, her work has been widely published in media, including the Vancouver Sun, the Toronto Star, Montreal Gazette, the Narwhal, and the National Observer. She was the resident medical expert on CBC TV's hit show, Stephen and Chris, for four seasons, and is a regular contributor to CBC Radio and CTV News. She was the inaugural winner of uh, University College's Young Alumni of Influence Award at the University of Toronto, a 2020 Jewel Innovation Grant recipient from the Canadian Medical Association, a 2021 World Parks Week Ambassador. She sits on the advisory committee of the IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas Health and Wellbeing Specialist Group, and is a clinical assistant uh, professor at the University of British Columbia. When we started reaching out to uh, find who could join us for this evening on this theme that was recommended to us by Terry Colgan, Melissa came to the top of a, of a list of folks to speak with, and I'm delighted that she's with us this evening. So, uh, Melissa, over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much, David, for that warm welcome. And it's such a pleasure for me to be joining you from the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations here on the west coast of Canada, otherwise known as Vancouver. And it's particularly lovely for me to be speaking with your audience at RBG and people um, calling in from home because our, the Royal Botanical Gardens actually mean something personal to me. So when I was growing up in Toronto, where I was born, my mother, um, she still is an avid gardener, an avid flower cultivator. Not sure what the, the, the official word for that is, but every year we would actually go to RBG to their annual orchid show before orchids were available in every grocery store. And so she still has some of the orchids that she bought from RBG growing in her living room window today. So the legacy of RBG lives on in my own family. So I'm just going to go ahead, I guess at this point and share my slides. And as David mentioned, um, we are going to be talking about the science behind the connection between nature and health and a bit about our nature prescription program called PARX. I'm also going to speak about how prescribing nature is good for the planet as well, not just people's health, and then talk about future directions for our program. And I also want to mention that it's a real pleasure to be uh, to be speaking before my colleague and friend, Dr. Miles Sargent, who's going to give you a great talk as well today. So I know that this talk is supposed to be about the science behind nature prescriptions, but the first thing I want you to do is a thought exercise. And it actually shouldn't be too hard because I notice right behind the podium there is a beautiful display of outdoor nature. And so what I want you to do to yourself, and you can put this in the chat if you're calling in from home or just say it out loud in the room where you are, but in one word, describe how you feel when you are outside in nature. I'll just give you a minute to do that or think that to yourself or say it out loud. I see someone writing home in the Q&A. Lots of words popping up, connected, peace, relaxed, at ease, calm and refreshed. And I'll get you to keep thinking about those words as I show you the next slide. 
which is a word cloud from one another talk that I gave. And as you can see, a lot of these same words come up, calm, peaceful, rounded, happy, restored, relaxed. And I think the great thing about spending time in nature is that we do have this intuitive sense that we feel so much better when we spend time outside. And in fact, that intuitive sense is backed up by a whole lot of evidence. So these are just two infographics that I've been given permission to share in the past. The one on the left is um, by the, from the Canadian Mental Health Association, and the one on the right is from a body in the U.S. And what it shows that is that across a whole number of different diseases, from bone density to diabetes, heart disease, and high blood pressure, to mood disorders like anxiety and depression, to work satisfaction, ADHD in children, pain scores and discharge after surgery in hospital, that spending time in and around nature and having access to nature is in fact one of the best things that we can do for our health. And when you think, when I think about why, one of the reasons why it's so important for me to advocate in this space is because I know that only 20 to 25% of our health status comes from what we do in our healthcare system. So as health professionals, we like to think that our job is important, but in fact, the job of things that lie outside of our healthcare system are much more important. And if you look at how nature can interact or access to nature can interact with a number of these different factors that make Canadians sick or conversely make them well, which you can see in this middle column, you can start to see how important it is for our healthcare system and for the health of our communities and patients to make sure that people have access to nature. And so as someone who was raised, I guess, I took an undergrad degree in human biology um, and, and science, the question is, what are the mechanisms that underlie the health benefits of nature? And there are a number of different theories. There are a couple of psychological theories called attention restoration theory and stress reduction theory um, that say that spending time in busy urban environments that have a lot of distractions. I don't know if you can hear that siren outside my window. <laughs> that's, a, that's a bit of a distraction for me right now. But anyway, one of the uh, symptoms of city living. Anyway, but uh, they distract us. They deplete our conscious powers of attention and they just make it harder for us to focus. Whereas when you spend time in nature, it's a source of soft fascination. So it's, so it's interesting, but doesn't require you to constantly direct your attention. And what that does is it restores your powers of attention and reduces stress and irritability. There are also volatile organic compounds that we breathe in um, when we spend time in nature called phytoncides that actually in studies in vitro and in vivo have been shown to increase your immunoproteins and natural killer cell function and numbers. Also, there are studies showing that just listening to the sounds of nature or looking at images of nature can reduce your stress far more than if you listen to other kinds of sounds or look at other kinds of art or a blank wall. So from our, from our noses, from what we smell to our brains, to what we see and we hear, again, spending time in nature, there's a significant uh, scientific basis for the benefits that we see when we do that. So I just wanna talk a bit about some of my favorite studies that have to do with the health benefits of nature. And I like this one because, well, one of the reasons is because it was uh, done right in my hometown of Toronto. Um, and this is, was a study that combined high resolution satellite imagery, individual tree data, and Ontario's health study data and self-reports of health perception. And what they found was that 10 more trees per block actually improved people's health perception, similar to an increase in their personal income of $10,000 per year, moving to a neighborhood with $10,000 per year higher median income, or being seven years younger. And I think this is really interesting because we know um, in how the health system that both income and age are significant factors when it comes uh, to our health status. So it's really neat how this study compared something objective like tree cover and then mapped that directly and compared it directly with income and, and uh, age outcomes or perceptions. I know I like this study because it speaks to nature as medication. So I want to point out that this is a pretty small pilot study, but I think they did a, a fairly good job of designing it. So this is a study from Chicago and they took 17 kids with ADHD and guided them on three different 20 minute walks through a city park, through a downtown area and through a residential area. And what they found was that a 20 minute walk in the park improved their digit span backwards performance, similar to levels in kids without ADHD. And this was compared to uh, the neighborhood and downtown walks, which did not have that significant um, increase in their cognitive abilities. And in fact, after crunching the numbers, they found that this 20 minute walk in the park only 
rivaled the peak effects of Ritalin, a prescription stimulant medication. So I think this is interesting for a number of reasons. One, one of the reasons being that it separates out that effect of exercise. Often people say, okay, well, what is it about nature time? Is it because I'm getting active and that's good for my brain? So in fact, what the study showed was that only the park walk was the one that significantly improved their cognition. And then also that it compares nature to, to medication. So I want to say that no one is saying that, uh, that uh, spending 20 minutes in nature, going for a 20 minute walk in a park is going to do everything that prescription stimulant medication does. But I think this speaks to how powerful nature time can be as an adjunct to what we prescribe and what we typically recommend in our offices as healthcare professionals. So a little more audience interaction here for people at home and people in, uh, in the audience at RBG. And the question is, as a physician, when I prescribe something, what's the dose? How much total nature should I prescribe? How much each time? And in the last few years, evidence about ideal dosing has been coming out. So I want you to, to answer this, either call it out in the room, type it into the chat again. How much nature do you need per week? So um, people report significantly better health and well-being after spending how many hours in nature per week? Is it one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, or five hours? What do people think? I see one person's answering two. Two hours, wow, there are lots of twos here. Three hours. Okay, so we're almost evenly split between twos and threes. Someone answered five. And in fact, the answer is two hours. So this comes from a study that was released in 2019. And it was a study of close to 20,000 adults in England. And they asked them how much recreational time in nature they spent each week, and then asked them to report what their health and well being was like. And what they found was that adults' likelihood of reporting good health or high well being was significantly greater when their nature contact was greater than or equal to 120 minutes or two hours per week. And so that's why we have a standard recommendation in our program that people spend at least two hours in nature each week. Now, if you spend two hours outside, we're not going to say cut it off there, you've done, you've done your bit, because the positive associations do continue to accrue up to the 200 to 300 minute uh, per week mark. But we do recommend a minimum of two hours per week based on this study and based on the evidence. Now, my second question for you is, how big should this nature pill be? How much nature time should we get each time? And so my question for you, if you, can, you want to answer in the chat again or call it out in the room, is where does the most efficient drop in cortisol or primary stress hormone levels happen between how many minutes in nature? Is it 5 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 60, or 1 to 2 hours? I'll just give you a minute to answer that. Okay, we've got uh, a kind of red here between two, four, three. Looks like the majority of people are answering 10 to 20 minutes, which is interesting. Okay, 30 to 60, 10 to 20. Okay, it's a really wide range of answers here. The actual answer is 20 to 30 minutes. So this also comes from a study that was released in 2019. And it looked at three dozen people who lived in the city, adults who lived in the city over two months. And they asked them to have a nature experience in an outdoor place that brought them a sense of contact with nature at least three times per week and for 10 minutes or more. And the interesting thing about this study is that they had them self-defined. They didn't say you have to go to this specific park for this amount of time. They just said, when you feel like you've had a meaningful experience in nature, you document it and you check your cortisol levels. And what they found was that their cortisol or stress levels or stress hormone levels were more than 20% lower after a nature experience compared to a non-nature experience. And in fact, the efficacy of that drop in the cortisol hormone was greatest between 20 to 30 minutes. So you can see this kind of third discontinuous line here. So a lot of us are really, we lead busy lives, have a lot on the go, and we're trying to find find how to fit in nature time. And so we do, again, have a standard recommendation in our program that you spend at least 20 to 30 minutes in nature to get the biggest bang for your buck. 
when you're having that nature experience. And it's also easy to remember two hours a week, at least 20 minutes each time. Now, some people ask, why is the BC Parks Foundation, which is uh, you know, the organization, the charity, they're the official charitable partner of BC Parks, why, do, why are they running a nature prescription program when their primary focus is conservation? And the reason is that health is a really effective message to get people to support policies. So we can take some of these lessons from the research around climate change. Um, so this was, there was a big uh, study conducted with over 7,500 participants in five countries around the world. And they asked participants to read five pairs of statements and asked them which would make them more likely to support policies tackling climate change. So they used different framings like health framing or environmental framing or um, migration framing uh, and or economic framing, which we often hear from government. And what they found was that health and environmental framing increased people's support for those policy proposals. Economic framing had, in fact, no effect on the average person. Opportunity framing, meaning these are all the benefits of this policy proposal, increased people's support more than threat, or these are all the negative things that will happen, uh, more than threat framing, and also focusing on present impacts were more motivating uh, than future impacts. And that's really what we try to do in our program. We try to focus on current health impacts and the opportunities in our messaging when we speak to the public, because this is more motivating to the general public to change their behavior. You'll notice there, there are a couple of stars on health and opportunity framing. And in fact, um, these were the only two kinds of framing that convinced people who were not concerned about climate change at all to support uh, the policies that were proposed. So again, if you use health framing, if you use opportunity framing, you'll be bringing in the largest number of people when you're speaking to policy proposals or making policy proposals. All right, now I wanna speak a bit about how connecting to nature good for the planet and not just for people. Um, we know that healthcare is a major contributor to global carbon dioxide emissions. And in fact, if global healthcare were a country, it would be the fifth highest emitter in the world. So anything that improves people's health status will also reduce the burden on the healthcare system and reduce overall carbon emissions within the healthcare system. Also having nature in cities makes cities healthier, not only the people within them, but also the infrastructure within them, which I'll talk a bit more about on the next slide. Research also tells us that children who have more nature experiences are more likely to become adult environmentalists and adults who are more connected to nature are more likely to protect it. So they're not only more likely to engage in supporting conservation initiatives, which makes a lot of sense because you protect what you love, but people who are more connected to nature tend to engage in other pro-environmental behaviors like recycling, like uh, energy conservation, like voting for climate advocates. So I like to think that every time a health professional in our program prescribes nature, they're doing, they're doing a small part for the planet at the same time. Also, Ingrid Anderson, the executive director of the UN Environment Program has said that nature is one of the most effective ways of combating climate change and should be part of every country's climate strategy. So it's estimated that if we fully embrace nature-based solutions for climate change that focus on expanding, restoring, and sustainably managing nature, that this could get us over a third of the way towards our 2030 Paris Agreement targets. And this week, the latest IPCC report just came out, which was another sort of red alert call for, for society. And in fact, this is, this is something I think that sometimes my healthcare colleagues forget, not Dr. Sargent as he's gonna speak next, but we focus sometimes on, and we've seen, we've experienced the health effects of climate change, especially here on the West Coast with wildfires and flooding and the heat dome. But we don't always think about how preserving nature and biodiversity can be a major part in how we fight that as healthcare professionals and improve people's health at the same time. Anyway, globally, um, climate investments, uh, investments in nature conservation are far, far lower than investments in other forms of climate action. So I'd like to think that using our trusted healthcare professional voice can help close the gap uh, between the potential for nature-based solutions um, for climate change to, to slow warming and actual investment in those solutions. So as promised, I'm gonna speak a bit about how having more nature in our cities makes them healthier from an infrastructure perspective. Urban greening has a huge number of different benefits from reducing, from shade reducing the need for air conditioning when it's hot out, lowering energy demand, which reduces air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions when the grid is powered by fossil fuels. Um, green spaces and trees also remove air pollutants. They sequester carbon dioxide, they reduce flooding um, and also improve water quality. 
And it's estimated that every $1 invested in a tree returns up to $3 in benefits, something that's very useful to say to policymakers and not necessarily uh, the public when you're trying to convince them about the health benefits of, or the overall benefits of investing in nature. And it's also estimated that uh, shaded surfaces are 11 to 25 degrees Celsius cooler than peak temperatures of unshaded areas. And this map, in case you're wondering, is a map of the lower mainland of Vancouver and the Vancouver Health Authority, which is the health authority that I work in. And it's a map of how the city heats up in different ways in different neighborhoods during heat episodes. And in fact, the downtown east side, which you can see in the middle, kind of upper middle region of the map, is one of the hottest places um, in the entire health authority. And in fact, during the heat dome, which killed over 600 people in the space of one to two weeks, in fact, the highest number of hospitalizations in my health authority came from that area. And it should be no surprise to anyone that in fact, this is one of the areas of the city that has the least access to green space and, and the lowest amount of tree cover. And unfortunately, this follows a pattern similar to other cities in the country where people of lower income and racialized people tend to have less green space, less nature in the neighborhoods where they live. And so uh, the BC Center for Disease Control did an analysis of different factors that led to mortality or were linked to mortality during the heat dome. And in fact, lack of access to nearby nature was an independent risk factor for death during the heat dome. So as we can see, as climate change continues to heat up our cities and our, and our planet, um, access to nature and tree cover are not just nice to have, they're in fact must haves when we're thinking about future resilience of human populations and the infrastructure in our cities. I wanna talk a bit about how we know when our cities are healthy from a green space or a, or a tree cover perspective. And for this, I have to lean on my colleague, Dr. Cecil Kanine and Dykes 33300 rule. Um, and what this rule says is that we'll know that our cities are healthy from a tree and green space perspective when everyone in the city can see at least three trees from their windows. Um, when there's at least 30% tree cover in ecologically appropriate uh, area, cities a, a, across across every neighborhood, so not just in the rich areas, and also when everyone is within 300 a 300 minute walk, a three sorry 300 meter walk not 300 minute walk my goodness, 300 meter walk from a high quality green space, and this is based in fact on um, some different guidelines that different. Uh, kind of uh, urban urban centers and also different researchers have been putting out um, in the past few years. And I wanna zero in on this 30% tree cover statistic. So we, I have some great colleagues in Australia who do really groundbreaking work around tree cover, green space and non-communicable diseases. And what they found after again, crunching the numbers and controlling for different confounders was that areas of the city that have the lowest amounts of tree cover compared to 30% or higher tree cover in fact, have significantly lower rates of diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, psychological distress, poor sleep, and loneliness. So again, by investing in nature in our cities, we can have wider, wider impacts on our health, including chronic disease and mental health. So now I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna get into my favorite uh, part of the talk, which is speaking all about our nature prescription program. So PARX is Canada's National Nature Prescription Program. It's an initiative of the BC Parks Foundation, and it was first launched starting in the province of British Columbia in November, 2020, and has since then spread to every province across the country, um, finishing up with Newfoundland and Labrador on the East Coast in June of 2022. And in fact, we have a uh, Quebec-based francophone program called prescreenature.ca. So um, this is a bilingual program. And it's a program where any regulated health professional in any province can register to literally prescribe nature time to their patients. So when you register in our program, we'll send you a toolkit for prescribing nature. And one thing that you'll get is a customized nature prescription file that you can use to log nature prescriptions on our website. It has our standard recommendation for nature time at the top to make it easy and uh, make it easy to remember. And we also have a number of evidence-based uh, resources on our website, including uh, this handout. There are 14 different handouts actually based, uh, broken down by adult and pediatric health that speak to the health benefits of nature for a number of different um, disease categories. We have also been endorsed by 
a broad range of health organizations. So one of our criteria to launch in, in each province was endorsement by a major physician and a major nursing organization. And so we have endorsements from medical associations, from nursing associations, um, and other allied health professional associations from across the country, uh, including these ones and 85 other partners and endorsers. We were really proud when at COP26, so this is two COPs ago, when the World Health Organization specifically pointed out our nature prescription program, PARX, as an effective way to inspire protection and restoration of nature as the foundation of our health. And this, this, is, this started uh, kind of the wave of publicity that began around our program. And people really started, you know, in, in a global sense to, to sit up and notice our program. But what really set off a lot of that publicity was when we announced our collaboration with Parks Canada just about just over a year ago, actually in January of 2022, where prescribers in our program could prescribe free Parks Canada discovery passes to their patients to, in a tangible way, reduce one barrier to nature access. And so if you're a regulated health professional and you're again registered in our program, you can prescribe one free annual Parks Canada discovery pass per month to a patient who's uh, who would experience barriers to access, like that cost would be a barrier, and to those who live close to these Parks Canada administered sites to increase the chances that they'll actually use that pass. And that really made our numbers start to go exponential. We now, um, so after about one year of the program, we had 1,000 prescribers. And in the past year, we've registered 9,000 to 10,000 additional prescribers. And this actually um, includes over 5% of all practicing physicians in the country. And I don't know if you know physicians, but they're, they tend to be pretty slow to adapt to new practice innovations. So the fact that we've We've caught the attention and registered over 5% of all doctors in this country, I think is nothing short of incredible. We were also really proud when the Canadian Medical Association formally recommended nature prescribing in policy in October, in fact, in their environmentally sustainable health systems in Canada policy. So this is the first time a national physicians uh, association has enshrined a recommendation for nature prescribing in medical education and in practice in policy. And they also officially announced their endorsement of PARX at COP15, which is the biodiversity version of COP that happens every two years in Montreal. So lots of groundbreaking stuff happening with our program. And I do wanna mention that even though I, I think the, the evidence behind the health benefits of nature itself is, slam, is pretty slam dunk from chronic diseases to mental health to pediatric health, the actual efficacy of nature prescriptions themselves needs a bit more research because they're a pretty new phenomenon. They've only been around for a decade or so, starting um, in the US. And so we want to answer some questions about nature prescriptions themselves. How effective are they for improving health in the medium to long term? Most of the studies look at uh, shorter term outcomes. What's the most effective way to prescribe nature? What are the barriers and enablers for people? How do nature prescriptions benefit the economy? Even though the average person doesn't really care about that, governments really care about that when it comes to funding and investing in things. And also, how do people in Canada feel about nature prescriptions? So I want to mention that I'm, I was a co-author on this study that came from um, some colleagues that was spearheaded by some colleagues in Australia. And they did a, a national survey that looked at, among other things, people's interest in nature prescriptions. And what they actually found in Australia, when they asked adults the question, if your doctor recommended nature time to you, would you be more likely to spend time in nature? They found that over 80% of adults actually said yes to that question. And in terms of the subset of adults who weren't already spending two hours a week in nature, they found that over 70% of those adults who, who needed more nature contact actually answered yes to that question. So my sense is probably that Canada is quite similar, but um, and we are planning more research within Canada with uh, different partners to figure out this question. So anyway, there are a lot more research questions that have to be answered, even though, again, the science between the, the nature and health connection is pretty, uh, pretty solid. So in terms of next steps for our program, we're looking to eventually launch park prescriptions in the territories. We're also really aware that, you know, park passes are not the, or lack of access to park passes are not the only barrier to nature access. A question, a point that often comes up is lack of access to transportation to these green spaces. So we've been collaborating and speaking with different uh, transit and transportation organizations to try to reduce that barrier. Um, I want to mention that we don't only have uh, 
of benefits for access to national parks. In fact, we've partnered with a number of different nature-based organizations um, within BC to begin with, like the UBC Botanical Gardens and Natobe Gardens and outdoor, uh, outdoor experience providers to give our patients in, enrolled in our program either free or discounted access to these benefits. And so if anyone in the audience at home or um, on site at RBG knows of any of these major nature-based organizations, please feel free to reach out and connect us because we're always looking for ways to make it easier for our patients to access nature. Also, coming very soon in the next few months is the launch of our Park Prescriptions mobile application that you can, in your app, that you can put on your phone to track and incentivize nature time. So I have one more slide left, but before I go to that slide, I just want to share a story of one of the first patients um, who was ever prescribed nature in our program by one of my colleagues, actually, in my own practice. And this is one of the reasons why I continue to do this work and why I love this work so much is because of the real benefits that my own patients see on an everyday basis. And so I just, uh, I'm going to ask an AV person over there to roll this clip from CNN and share Marjorie's story. About a year ago now, I was in talking to my doctor and I just said, I can't shake this depression. He says, I've got just the thing, a prescription for you. I thought, oh goody, one more pill. And he says, no, 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 no. I want you to spend two hours during the week outdoors, minimum 20 minutes each time. And the more I did it, the better I felt. So it all came together way better than any medication I've ever had. Now, you know she's 75, so I've got to tell you that I'm 91. <laughs> so that's why she takes care of me. I try. I do try. Nature is everywhere. We can find it in the most unexpected places, and nature is health. Park Prescription or PARX is Canada's national nature prescription program. What the physician or nurse does is they sit down with the patient and they figure out what kind of nearby nature is, is in their community and then they work with them together to come up with a, a plan where they can incorporate nature time into their everyday lifestyle. Some cherry tomatoes. So this is the prescription and it just gives my name and it says my outdoor activity plan. In 2022, we announced a new collaboration with Parks Canada where licensed health professionals can now prescribe national discovery passes um, that give you entry to national parks. There are only two national nature prescription programs in the world, and the first one was actually founded right in the U.S. Cost can be a barrier where there are day use fees, so we're hoping that by prescribing these Parks Canada discovery passes that, that will reduce that barrier to nature access in a significant way. Well, there are two major theories as to why nature is so good for our brains. And the first one is called attention restoration theory. When we spend time in busy urban environments, all the hard edges and traffic and lights and people everywhere really make us have to constantly focus our attention to, to kind of navigate around those obstacles. Whereas when you spend time in nature, it's really this source of soft fascination. So what that does is it restores your powers of attention and it reduces that fatigue and irritability. The second major theory is called stress reduction theory. So basically when we spend time in nature after stressful events, it helps us be more resilient and recover faster. When I recommended nature for the first time to a patient of mine, I thought he's going to look at me funny and he's going to laugh at me. But he actually just nodded his head and said, you're absolutely right. When I spend more time in nature, I feel better. And so I think healthcare providers sort of have to get over our own mental biases against new sort of lifestyle interventions and, and prescribe something evidence-based like nature time more often. 50 days from seed to vegetable. I think the prescription helps in that it says this is a good thing to do, this is worth the effort to do. You need to get out of doors and just be surrounded by the greenery and by nature. I want people to know that nature should be a non-negotiable. The thing about heading outside is that you tend to start to naturally be more active. You'll feel calmer, you'll feel less depressed, less anxious. I think it's just a great way to deal with the stresses of modern life. I just love that video. Every time I see Marjorie and her husband, it makes me smile. And I do get updates from my colleague every now and then on how she's doing with her nature prescription. 
So to sum up, my key messages um, for this talk are that prescribing and spending time in nature are simple and effective interventions for improving patient and planetary health. Urban green spaces and tree canopy are essential for our health and remember that 33300 rule. And there is an established and growing body of health professionals prescribing nature across Canada. Um, join us, whether you're a patient or a prescriber, we are happy and enthusiastic to always welcome new people to our program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lam. We've got a lot of people clapping here. Uh, this has been uh, a wonderful introduction to this, uh, 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 the, cl the clinician's end of the, of, the, of the conversation, the science end of the conversation. Uh, we're going to shift now to our, uh, our, our in-person guest speaker. Um, Dr. Miles Sargent is a family physician who has worked with vulnerable populations, including people experiencing homelessness and the elderly for over 25 years. He is the founding medical director of the Shelter Health Network of Hamilton and the director of medically complex care at St. Peter's Hospital, the Hamilton Health Sciences Corporation. In addition to his clinical work, Dr. Sargent is the president of Trees for Hamilton and the co-founder of Peach Health Ontario, which stands for the Partnerships for Environmental Action by Clinicians and Communities for Hospitals and Health Care Facilities. The mission of Peach is to cultivate partnerships across, uh, the, uh, uh, across Ontario to support climate action. This, this provincial initiative has been engaged, engaging sorry, and empowering those in the health sector to take climate action, uh, to take actual climate action on their sites. To achieve the ideal green health facility, Peach collaborates with various sectors, including procurement, food, education, energy, management, pharmaceuticals, and building design. Trees for Hamilton has been planting native trees in areas of need with the goal of improving Hamilton's long-term health. Now Miles is involved in another province-wide initiative that will see thousands of trees planted at hospitals and healthcare facilities to honor and celebrate Ontario's health workers over the next five to 10 years. This initiative is, tall, is called Trees for Health Ontario, and it's supported by Trees for Life under its Trees for Heroes program. So I'd like to welcome up uh, Dr. Miles Sargent for our second presentation. Thanks, Miles. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you to the Colgans. Thank you for everybody who comes here tonight and all of you out there listening. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Lem, for a great talk. Uh, on the way in tonight, I saw an old friend who said to me, I hear uh, Dr. Lem is a real rock star, and, and uh, yes, she is. And so if you're wondering, why is the uh, garage band going after the rock star? Um, I'll just say this was strategic. You know, you never want to talk after Dr. Lem, but this was strategic. I thought, I'm going to let Dr. Lem do all the tough science stuff so I can, I can have a bit of fun up here. Um, I will be talking a bit of science. Um, let's see here. Uh, I, yes, I am a family doctor. I'm also an engineer. Uh, but, you know, before that, as a surprise to people, I was a boy. And this is... Uh, this is, this is not me, but this is a photo of a bunch of boys in the mid-1970s playing street hockey. And as you know, that was sort of a, a national pastime, playing street hockey and having to move the net when the car came. Um, I was going to say, trick question, where am I in this photo? And it's a trick question because I'm actually in the back of that car. Because this was a Sunday, and Sunday in our house was family day. I, I did bring or ask my sister to come today, so she'll get a kick out of this. I think we are the only family on the street that had family day. So all the boys were playing hockey, and I was looking out the back of the car because we had one of those massive station wagons with the rear seating, rear facing seat, watching my friends play. And where were we going on a Sunday? We were going to the RBG, so this is a real uh, photo. 
and uh, yes, absolutely the horror. Can you imagine being 12 years old, you know your friends are playing street hockey, and you are with your parents, your sister, your kid brother, in the woods. I mean, who takes their kids to the woods on the weekend? Uh, and to make matters worse, if you look carefully at this, this is Hamilton, mid-1970s. Daryl Sittler, Boreas Salming, Mike Palmatier, Lanny McDonald. We're all Leafs fans. What's my brother doing wearing a Habs jersey? It's like rubbing salt in the wounds. So this is what we did on a Sunday. And this is a couple years before. Um, this shows maybe it wasn't always such a bad thing. We could go tobogganing in the, in the lilac dell. Uh, and that was back in the day, speaking of climate change, that once it snowed in December, as you remember, the snow stayed on the ground for four months. You know, we don't have that anymore. So I, I did develop some fond memories uh, of the woods, uh, so much so that I started to play in the woods. This is not me. Um, I started to play in the woods. I loved being in the woods. You know, when you do talks like this, you reflect on things you don't necessarily think about very often. I was actually thinking, like, what, what was in my mind as a kid on an afternoon walking down the street, Little John Road, through the houses on Robin Hood. There were no fences back then. You just walked through people's property and go down the woods for a couple hours. I know I like climbing trees, uh, but it's sort of interesting to me that you would go down there by yourself and amuse yourself uh, for a couple of hours. No one, no one told me to do it. And uh, yeah, Melissa covered this one. Um, a meta-analysis. Children who spend more time in nature are more likely to grow up into environmentalists and, and adults like you who are more connected to nature are more likely to protect it. So going back to this, I did learn to love nature. I loved climbing trees. The boy on the right makes me think of me maybe looking up into a tree or maybe at a bird or maybe listening to my dad whistling because that's, that was the whistle some people are nodding in here. That was the whistle. It's like every dad on the block had their own whistle, right? And you knew when you had to come home for dinner. So some young parents today would say, who would let their kids play in the woods with no supervision? I mean, we've, we've radically changed. But this was the 1970s. We were free-range kids, like free-range chickens. And helicopter parenting hadn't been invented. What we had back then was what I would call pickup truck parenting. And, and this is a real, oh, I missed it. There we go. Pickup truck parenting. Um, this is us. I think this is likely Alberta. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're really uh, whipping along there. You can see by our hair, that's Laura on the left and Matt in the middle and me on the right. Um, things were very different back then. So what does a nature-loving kid do as a teenager? Um, my, my pickup truck parents had a broken camera, as a, the family story goes. They had a broken camera for six years, so there are no pictures. So I'm, I, I need to improvise here. Um, <laughs> what I did as a teenager is I ran, and I ran, and I ran. I ran thousands of miles in, in, the, in the areas around Hamilton. Hamilton is an incredible place. You know, we have all kinds of great places to, to go. You can see from the sign there, this is Bruce Trail. Um, why did I do it? This was not an intellectual exercise. I think I probably could have named a maple tree if it was the right season. But I wasn't thinking about nature per se. I was just out. I, I suppose maybe I was meditating. It was a very mindless adventure. I ran in the winter. Uh, I put peace and privacy there. Uh, it's funny, when Melissa did her, her thing at the beginning, I, I thought peaceful was the word I thought of. And clarity and focus, um, all the waterfalls in Hamilton, all the beautiful places in, in Hamilton, what a great opportunity. Um, then, what's really been interesting to me, I didn't know as a kid why I liked it so much, and now there's all these studies coming out, and there have been for a few years. This one is from 2015. Nature experiences reduces rumination. This is by Stanford. Um, the first line there, this study suggests that 
decreased nature experience may help explain the link between urbanization and mental illness. And on the bottom, people who walk in green space instead of busy streets have fewer repetitive racing thoughts, and so maybe that's why I was out there. Um, I did get injuries. I, I ran so much, I had a lot of re repetitive strain injuries. I didn't know how to represent that with that little character. Ooh, I didn't move it again. <laughs> Um, I did get injuries. I didn't fall down the hill and hit my head, but I, I had repetitive strain injuries, which is my segue into medicine. That is how I got interested in medicine. I thought I'd go into rehab medicine. I ended up doing uh, family medicine. So and now I'm moving forward quite a few years. That is one of my sons on a zip line, uh, 2014 at uh, Long Point. Um, you know, my view of the world, if it's, if it's good for me, it's probably good for my family. So kids have had no choice. So I went into medicine, and when you're in medicine, they used to say, I don't know if they still say this, they used to say, when you're trying to decide what am I going to do with my career, specialists know everything about nothing. And generalists, like family docs, know nothing about everything. And don't tell me why I loved the second one. I thought, I want to be that person who knows nothing about everything. And so here I am today, and I want to remind you before question period, I know nothing about everything, okay? Um, so I do have lots of hats. I am a land steward. Uh, I do uh, residential addiction treatment for men, medically complex care, uh, Trees for Hamilton, Peach Health Ontario, and now the Coalition for Green Health Care. And there are, of course, many other roles of which I know nothing or very little about. You can just ask my kids. Uh, residential inpatient addiction treatment. So where I work, Wayside House, uh, men are suffering either from alcohol use disorder or substance use. And can you imagine being sick enough with disease that you are choosing to live in this facility with a group of 20 men for eight to 10 weeks to try to recover? Uh, so there is a history of trauma, um, mental health disease, often jail time, and their lives have spiraled down to the point that they're no longer married, that they don't have housing. Um, I do the parts on the bottom, medical services there. This is a picture of Wayside House on Charlton Street near uh, St. Joe's Hospital. 75% of our patients have what is called concurrent disorder, which is a combination of a substance use disorder and a mental health disorder. These are the common mental health disorders that I see with the patients I have. Post-traumatic stress, attention deficit, major depression, anxiety, psychotic disorder, and conduct disorder. So I also work at St. Peter's, prettiest hospital in Hamilton. They have a beautiful uh, place out back. If you know St. Peter's, nothing to do with me. It's been that way for a long time. Uh, you know, it's funny, I just had the thought. My mom was a VON nurse and their offices used to be uh, there, and I remember sitting in the car. You know, back, another thing about the 70s, you know, parents would just kind of leave you in the car for a couple of hours <laughs> waiting for them to finish their charts. But anyhow, um, St. Peter's is essentially a geriatric hospital, uh, frail elderly. We have dementia care, rehab, uh, medically complex, and end of life. It's tough being in a hospital. So, you know, a lot of our patients have, have mental health issues. So, somehow, in my life, I've chosen to work with uh, vulnerable populations. Ooh, something happened there. Let's see here. Okay, there we are. Yeah, I've chosen to have a theme of vulnerable populations, uh, homelessness, frailty, addictions, mental health, um, and clearly these can be stressful jobs. And so we um, decided to buy a farm. I mean, is that what you do when you have a stressful job? We bought a farm. Uh, my spouse and I knew nothing about farming. I mean nothing about farming. I knew nothing about septics or wells and all that stuff. And I, I know nothing about business either. I mean, let's face it, I'm a doctor. Um, but as you can tell, I've always been fascinated by trees and, and forests. We started planting trees. I didn't just want to rent the property out. Uh, we got to 2,000 fairly quickly, and then I didn't want to sell them. Uh, we became what's called land stewards, and I actually uh, started to plant on my neighbor's properties uh, with their permission for the most part. Uh, so th these are some of my trees. Uh, look, I'm not, a, I'm not an artist. This is an iPhone, but this is what a tree looks like when you hug it. If you get up closely, um, 
the bark is beautiful. How, how was it going to sell these native species? And so I couldn't. So I started to collect them, just like I used to collect hockey cards. And Hamilton's a special place for a lot of reasons. Hamilton has three forests running through it. Hamilton has the, the Boreal from the north, it has the Great Lakes Forest, and it has the Carolinian Forest from the south. And so we have much more native trees and shrubs than other areas. I think we have over 130 that are close to this area. So I've been collecting them. Um, we have over 120 different native trees and shrubs in our property now. And uh, I'm just teasing David here. I think we might have more than the RBG. Um, so, uh, gosh, I could just scroll through these all, all night. I love, uh, I love my trees, but <laughs> just show you some of the different species here. We don't have time for me to talk about them all. That's a pawpaw on the right and a tamarack on the bottom. So everyone should have a tree mentor. Lorraine Ironside is my tree mentor. Uh, she came out to our property years ago when I was just figuring things out. Mm -hmm and helped us with soil sampling, and sometimes they had free tree programs. She was working for the Ministry of Natural Resources. Um, Melissa told you that number, about 30% tree cover. Hamilton, I haven't looked at this lately, but first time I looked, we had about 18.5% tree cover. I think we were maybe over 19%. So we need a lot more trees in Hamilton. It's actually one million more trees. I, um, I asked Lorraine, if there was a need for a tree charity in Hamilton. And she said, yes, indeed. And again, I figured that if it was good for my family, it's good for the community. Uh, Lorraine truly is the brains of our operation. And I, like everything I do in my life, I am the Energizer Bunny. So we founded Trees for Hamilton in 2012. And like any, anything, we started small. We started on uh, local farmers' property, land stewards, uh, and my best volunteers were my kids because they couldn't say no. So these are uh, my sons with me here. Um, I think that one is at Manor Run Farm, if I'm not mistaken. We had a small board. We planted 150 trees in the first year. Any tree charity needs three things. You need money, obviously, to buy the trees. You need places to plant. There are some of our partners. There are early partners. Uh, of course, RBG's on there. And you need volunteers. You'd be interested to know the toughest thing now, 12 years along, is land, is finding land. We, we have a good amount of donations. We've, lots of people want to volunteer. It's tough to find land. So more on the, the science. Uh, Dr. Lem would have mentioned some of these things already. Conditions which benefit from tree or green exposure, depression, anxiety, ADHD, anger, conduct disorder, heart disease, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, lung disease, skin cancer, heat exposure, improved immune function. I like to tell people about this website, greenhealth.washington.edu. So if you're interested in these kinds of studies, Washington State University has been collecting these studies on this website for the last 40 years of studies. And so that's a screenshot, but I, I invite you to, to check that out. And someone named Wolf did a study a couple years ago, basically looking at all of the small studies that have been done on various outcomes and summarizing them. The, the green piece of the pie is a positive study, gray is a mixed study, and pink is a negative study. So I've underlined the ones which maybe have the be best combined evidence. So. Um, Excess heat and thermal comfort, not surprisingly, with trees. Uh, 16 out of 17 are positive there. Cognition and attention, mentioned by Dr. Lem, 10 out of 13 positive. Mental health, anxiety, uh, physiological stress, immune system, and weight status. All uh, have quite a bit of uh, data behind them. Over the course of time, there were more uh, tree charities in Hamilton and there are also the places like RBG, the Conservation Authority, the City of Hamilton. So we started to meet every three months all of these groups, usually at the Environment Hamilton building, to talk about what we're all doing, to collaborate. And so it made us, as Trees for Hamilton, knowing there are other groups in town, focus more on the health part. So how do we, how do we focus on health and the health connection? Number one, 
we do facilitate patients exercising in natural landscapes. Uh, number two, we try to bring the forest to the patient. I would say that might be one of the biggest things we do. And number three, like tonight, we educate about trees and health and about equity. That is uh, on the bottom right is a planting we did at Vanier Towers in partnership with Green Venture. So intention number one, exercise in natural environments. These studies go back quite a ways. You can imagine 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago, we were mainly in rural communities and uh, not so much in cities. And so over time, of course, most of us live in cities now. And then it requires these kinds of studies, which may seem obvious, to be done. Uh, Kaplan and Kaplan, Michigan uh, University, described restorative environments as those settings that foster recovery from mental fatigue. Hartig has done a number of studies looking at blood pressure, cortisol levels, about mental fatigue being relieved by a walk in a natural setting. Mitchell was looking at the difference between activity in a gym versus activity outside. You get more of a boost from exercising outside. So at some point, the penny dropped for me that the benefits of trees and nature help the same conditions that my patients at Wayside had. So this was kind of an obvious one. Let's get the patients out planting trees. And the executive director, that's Regan there in the yellow coat, and the, the main clinical lead, Bobby Silver there, uh, we all agreed we would start doing this every year. So we've done this eight times now, um, giving the opportunity for these guys to come and plant trees. So this was, uh, I think this might have been our first one, um, 2015 at Mount Albion. At one point they, they asked the guys in the house why they liked it, and you can read their answers there. This is a, a planting on the, the right. Uh, again, we, we take photos where we can uh, keep things confidential. 50 point conservation area 2017. The one statement here that I highlighted in green, you know, I shouldn't have been surprised, but I was surprised. The, the guys I work with often have started drinking when they're 11 or 12 years old and they, they haven't really stopped since and I'm meeting them when they're 35 and they've gone 20 years uh, of, of addiction and not being sober. So just the idea of I don't usually do sober activities. I enjoyed myself. I know somehow that still kind of gives me the chills. Um, so nature and emotional regulation. This uh, is a study which looked at or grouped a whole bunch of studies together. On the right there, you can see which uh, yeah, meta-analysis, 25 different studies. Here are the ones that drifted most from the, the median showing they had a fair bit of evidence. Uh, attention, energy, tranquility, anger, fatigue, sadness and depression, all benefiting from exposure to nature. So here we are, the, we always have the guys put the shovels in front of their faces. We are at Grey Doe Trail and sadly of 70 community plantings. My sister's helping me out there. Thanks, thanks. Laura, maybe you want to stand over here when I do it. I've got two clickers tonight. This is why this is happening. Um, so I've got to click them at the same time. Here we are at Grey Doe Trail. Uh, again, the guys have the shovels in front of their faces for confidentiality. Uh, th this will go down as the, the only planting um, a group that I came with did not finish because there were so many roots. Oh, gosh, it was discouraging. Um, but the guys had a good time anyway. Uh, we don't obviously just plant with the wayside guys. This is Starfish Canada. It's a, uh, a group from uh, originally from McMaster. And here we are at Pine Tum Trail. I I'm doing the RBG collection here. Uh, the aviary with some Westdale High School students, uh, not coincidentally including my son and some of his friends. Still rope see, um High school volunteer hours, piece of cake, right? Okay, and uh, Princess Point, this is the end of Bond Street, uh, family medicine residents and, uh, and public health residents. I have a daughter, she's taking the photograph here and that is her, her boyfriend on the left there, the big guy. 
uh, Liam, great guy, and boy, can he ever plant a lot of trees. She, she picked well. <laughs> RBG, the fairly new Indigenous Plant Medicines Trail with some McMaster medical students. I mean, that was, a, that was an interesting one for them to plant some of the species and learn a bit about um, Indigenous plant medicines. Okay, intention number two, bring the forest to the patient. There's a study from a long time ago, Ulrich, uh, surgical recovery rates improve with the view. He looked at a hospital ward where one side looked at a brick wall and the other side of the, the ward looked at nature and in every possible measure, the people looking at nature improve faster. Death of the ash trees, um, emerald ash borer ash trees, which happened a number of years ago uh, in Canada and in the northern states. Donovan looked at not state by state, he actually looked county by county to see mortality rates of heart and lung disease before the trees died and after the trees died. And sadly, after the trees died, mortality rates went up. I'm going to start going a little faster here. This is a photo I like to show. This is uh, Hamilton General from 1910. Back then it was called City Hospital. Uh, this is from a postcards website. And uh, they kind of had it figured out back then. To me, that's a, that's a beautiful building. They have a, a fountain in the front and lots of trees. And somewhere we, we kind of lost our way. I'm, I'm not trying to put Hamilton General down. I, I think that all the modern hospitals don't have enough trees. So it took a number of meetings. Uh, back then, of course, you didn't meet virtually. You had to go into the building. But we, we talked to all the right people. And Hamilton General was agreeable. We would start planting trees. We, we plant about a dozen trees there every, every year now. This is the hospital I work at, St. Peter's Hospital. We plant with staff, with family members. Um, this is our, our, one of our pharmacists and one of our nurse practitioners. Extended care, long-term care. This is uh, six years ago now, a long-term care facility up on the, uh, the I'm, I'm, th I'm thinking about Dr. Lem here and calling Hamilton Mountain. Hamilton Mountain just feels strange. She's out there in BC. Up on Hamilton Mountain, uh, extended care. The residents came out to watch in their wheelchair. The staff came to help plant. We planted some white pine for privacy, and we planted eastern red bud so that residents could see birds and berries out their, their windows. Uh, nature and depression in adults. Uh, this, this is why we plant it at health facilities, so people can have a view and people can go outside and see the trees and be in nature. So I think that this talk, or this concept of bringing trees to the patient dovetails nicely with what Dr. Lem is doing, because almost all of my patients happen to be patients that cannot benefit very much from a park prescription because they can't get there. So we need to bring the park to them. Um, we're all happy after doing the planting. Uh, so finally, intention number three, education. The major determinants of health may have little to do with the healthcare system. This is part of the reason sometimes I wonder, am I doing more with a spade than I am with a stethoscope? Climate change is the greatest challenge of the 21st century, threatening human health and development. And Sadly, the wealthy in the world, the wealthy countries, wealthy communities make CO2 and the poor suffer. And planting trees is one way we can create an equity initiative. So this is just a real estate website. I took some photographs of student houses in Westdale. Uh, not the biggest houses, nice houses. And then I took some photographs of Burlington Street uh, the other end of town, and I don't know if you can pick up the, the main difference here, but the main difference to me is trees. And I, I, I knew roughly what Dr. Lem was going to be talking about tonight, but I'm going to go over the same idea. So the Code Red study from 10 or so years ago, Hamilton Spectator, the average lifespan for people living in the downtown part of the city is 74 years. And for people living in the suburbs, it's over five years longer, five and a half years longer. And when they did this study, they were not fully able to explain the differences from downtown to suburbs by poverty issues. And so I've always wondered, is it because there are no trees or very few trees? 
and is it because it's hotter? And so this came out just a month ago, and it's funny, I have a very similar slide. I, I, I have 70 tonight, by the way, so that's why I didn't add all my slides, but I have a very similar slide to the one that Dr. Lem showed of BC, which shows Hamilton, a heat map, and if you put that heat map beside the code red map, it's almost identical. The hot areas are the same areas where the mortality is higher. So this came out a month ago, cooling cities through urban green infrastructure, a health impact assessment of European cities, showing that increasing tree cover to that magic 30% number would cool cities by a mean of about half a degree Celsius and would decrease premature deaths uh, in the city about 2% less of the summer deaths. So we try to plant uh, in places downtown that don't have trees. So this is McQuestion Urban Farm you may have heard about. So we were there uh, early on planting trees. This is the Wayside Group again. Vanier Towers again. Uh, we have one of our shelter health network clinics there. So that was kind of my foot in the door to reach out to them and say, do, do you want some trees there? Uh, this is COVID times, and so there's only a few of us. Uh, boy, you wouldn't believe the work we had to do to convince people it would be safe to plant trees during COVID. But I will say the traffic wasn't bad getting there. This is Riverdale and Stony Creek, and a few people I know are doing this thing called the SCORE Project. They're, ooh, okay, thank you, thank you, Laura. <laughs> All right, okay. Stony Creek, Riverdale Community, East End of Hamilton, high-rise buildings. These communities do not get much exposure to nature. And it is mainly uh, new immigrants in this community. And so this group is doing a lot of work to figure out why they're fairly close to nature, but they can't quite get there. And one thing they're finding is that this community really, their whole world is, is within that two blocks. The kids don't have a place to lock bikes. They don't go off riding bikes. That's Centennial Parkway. There's safety issues. So they're probably close to places, but they don't go there. So we are partnering with them uh, to try to plant more trees in that area. But you can see there's not a lot of places to put trees. So here we are. I showed you 2012-13. We've come a long way. This is. Uh, Simon, who's our chartered accountant on the board. Last year we did 12 plantings, including three different hospitals, over 80 unique volunteers. I don't count myself 12 times. We are funded by a number of different places every year. It's a different mix. Uh, Turner Family Funeral Home comes through every year. Private donors, HHS usually helps with their own plantings. Hamilton City Green Fund has, has helped us more than once. This is our board of directors. Uh, amazing group of people. We, we have a ton of fun. Uh, we don't exactly follow Robert's rules at our meetings, and I think we get a lot done. However, there are two things in the world that I'm most passionate about. One is trees and biodiversity, and the other is carbon mitigation. So I'm just going to drift off a little, a little ways into carbon mitigation. These are carbon emissions by region in the world well, actually over the last 150 years, but you can see over the last 50 years the way it's gone up, and certainly uh, the Americas in beige there are, are a big part of the problem. Planting trees does help this problem, but we do need to decrease the amount of carbon that we make, the amount of CO2 that we make. This is an interesting slide. This recently came out looking at the top 10 global risks um, over the next 10 years, and you can see in purple they've got cybercrime. So this is everything. And in green, they're showing all the environmental risks. So there's a lot of environmental risks considered over the next 10 years. What do trees do? Trees do help mitigate climate change, decrease the CO2, increase oxygen, but we can't rely on trees to do all of it. Uh, trees also help with climate change adaptation. They actually do help replace what we lose in natural disasters, and of course they do a ton for biodiversity. But we do need to do more about uh, mitigating climate change, which is my other big passion. So, gosh, it's almost two years ago, a few of us got together and imagined what the ideal green facility 
in healthcare would look like. And had a young architect draw this up. And so, look, there's different versions of this, but this is what he came up with. It has an H on the front for hospital, but this could be a library, it could be a university building, any number of buildings. And we picked eight categories we thought were the most important categories to go after in terms of decreasing carbon. Um, and so here I'm getting into the idea that if this is good for our city, it's probably good for our province. And so you'll see on the bottom here that natural systems is one of the eight. And so as David mentioned, what we did was reach out to the big tree organizations around the province, Landscape Ontario, Ontario Parks, Forest Ontario, Echo Health, One Bench, One Tree, to say, can we do what we're doing here in Hamilton at the General and St. Peter's all around the province? I'm a fairly ambitious guy. There are some people in this group that are far more ambitious than me. I thought 100,000 would be a good number, but one of our meetings, somebody Googled the number of healthcare workers in Ontario, saw it was 850. That became the number, 850,000. I could not talk them down. These folks, as much as I love them, they generally plant in conservation areas. They have no idea how tough it is to plant around a hospital. But we will plant near hospitals or at hospitals. We've already started, this was launched uh, last September. And I wish my mom was still around. Mark Cullen came to our uh, launch at the Hamilton General, September 22. I think we planted at about 30 different places in Ontario now with all of our different partners. And let's face it, if this is good for Ontario, it's good for the country. So we will be uh, launching a national initiative, likely out of Edmonton this summer. And um, I think David mentioned I'm now a part of the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare. And so what we're doing with this group is imagining not just the ideal green facility, but the ideal green city or community. Um, that same young architect is drawing this one up. And in the meantime, I am using a photo of Oslo, which is one of the top four sustainability uh, countries in the world. And I've put our, what will be our little icons on there. Because healthcare, like anything in the community, interacts with all different parts of the community. Uh, you can kind of see manufacturing up there in the top right corner. That's going to be a huge thing. Supply chain is a huge part of our carbon problem. We need to work with manufacturers. Agriculture over there on the left, we need to be getting more local products and not shipping most of our healthcare food from California. Uh, uh, university, of course, we interact with. Government, we interact with. And of course, on the bottom here, biodiversity. And so I think the ideal green city is not when you're planting trees in a city, but more when a city exists within a forest. And we, obviously, we have a long way to go. So I want to finish by saying thank you. I want to say thank you to my parents who aren't here. Thank you for the park prescription you gave me so many years ago. And I want to say thank you to RBG, which was my park growing up, and I was very privileged to have it. And finally, because my sister's older than me, and I you know, don't want to get slapped around after this lecture, I'm going to end with something from one of her short stories. Uh, she is the writer in the family. I am definitely not. I will remain a gardener even when I'm without property or living blooms, even when I'm frail, arthritic, and unable to tend growth. I'm a gardener because I've been gifted with the lens of astonishment to see divinity and poetry. I see with the eyes of my mother, her father, and his mother before him. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Watering, water, water yourself there, Miles. Uh, thank you so much, Miles. That was a wonderful presentation, which came full circle for me in so many ways, um, and I think really put uh, a very strong complimentary message to what we'd heard from Dr. Lem earlier on. Um, perhaps a different perspective, but for me, one of the main things that came through are the outcomes. Uh, how do we take action that actually improves the outcomes for people? And both of these are so important. So I'd like to suggest we take a few minutes uh, to uh, have some questions, both from the audience and uh, I need help from um, Allie back there. She's been working the question process. 
And uh, Dr. Lem's back with us again. Hello. So do we have, uh, first of all, any folks in the audience here who would like to ask a question? Please. Hi, uh, Dr. Sargent. Thank you for your presentation. Um, just wanted to ask you, you spoke of uh, bringing the forest to the people and addiction. Do you have any, uh, know of any strategies uh, where uh, possibly could help us with the addiction that North Americans have to that, um, that wasteland that's in front of a lot of houses, otherwise known as a lawn? <laughs> and also, if you could, uh, any suggestions on uh, maybe raising the dandelion somehow to such a status like the the trillium flower, so that we'll we won't we'll stop cutting it down. Because I grew up in the 70s, and I remember we used to mow them down, and they were like an evil yellow carpet or something. So, but uh, anyways, the lawn thing. Have, have you heard of anything movements like to get rid of lawns? Lawns, as you know, a controversial thing in. North America, people love to have their well manicured lawns and their cut lawns. A lawn which is fully grown actually does sequester carbon. Maybe not as much as a tree, but it does. So it actually does become uh, something for mitigation. I, I don't know about the societal laws or the public laws about making the switch. We do need to move in that direction, like you're absolutely right. And in terms of having more trees in the community, most of the land in the community is privately owned. So I talk about these charities, other charities in town that I work with, and obviously RBG and the Conservation Authority. There's only so many areas we can plant on. Like people need to step up, stop cutting their lawns, put in pollinator gardens, put in trees, super important. I don't know if I have a lot of power to, to change that. The, the one thing that we have done from the Peach Health Ontario perspective, I talked about the eight different categories we look at. Accreditation Canada announced last June that hospitals need to add sustainability language and start taking action on sustainability, which is a massive thing for hospitals in Canada. And so one of the things we did within Peach was we made a really simple guide and inside that guide, there is a checklist of 22 items. The 22 items we think are potentially the 20, 20 of the best items you can do to de decrease carbon. And one of them was that we say that every facility should have 25% green cover, whether you're putting things on your roof at the hospital, growing more trees. We do not count cut grass. So that's one way we're encouraging hospitals, at least, and health facilities to not cut the grass. So I hope that answers your question. I'm just going to throw yeah. a little bit of an answer in there myself. So there was a study that was done in uh, Michigan of over 100 different high schools, and they looked at different academic outcomes, like their intention to graduate, intention to go on to post-secondary education and their standardized test scores. And what they found was when they looked at their views from their cafeteria rooms and other classrooms onto the outside, they actually found that looking out onto lawns was not a benefit for their cognition. Uh, lawns and shrubs, but looking out onto trees, in fact, was a benefit. So if we, for example, educated people about the fact that if you have a more biodiverse front lawn or backyard, that's in fact better for your overall cognition and mental health. That might be a rationale for them to stop uh, covering their front yards with, with grass. Um, but I think that's interesting. It's not just the green. It's actually the biodiversity and, and trees that seem to imp improve health outcomes um, when people are looking at green views. One other answer locally is that Hamilton now has a climate committee. Uh, Linda Lukasik and Trevor Imhoff are, are doing this kind of work. I remember years ago, we uh, as a group, of, you know, th this collaborative group I'm talking about was, was looking at bylaws for cutting trees down in Hamilton. Other communities do have those kind of bylaws. There are some communities like Oakville, which I think is probably closer to 35% tree cover. So there's things that we can learn from our, our neighbors and uh, we do need to do better in Hamilton.
Hi, um, I just had a quick question there. Is there any difference, or I, I should say a seasonal difference, for when you spend time outside versus the summertime versus the dead of winter when you're not seeing as much of that foliage? That's why we grow evergreens. Do Dr. Lem? Sure, happy to try to take a stab at that one. So the research that's been done on nature time tends to be done on nature time in more temperate seasons. I know that there there is at least one study that was done in Japan looking at people spending out time outdoors in the snow in forests. And in fact, they did experience positive health outcomes when they headed outside in the cold. Um, so that evidence is is definitely emerging, but, uh, but yes, certainly um, there is more research done on, on temperate times. Now I will say that along with some researchers at Wilfrid Laurier University, we're embarking on a study soon of households across Canada looking at nature time and health outcomes and one of the questions we have because we do have seasonality here in Canada is the amount of nature time that people spend outdoors in different seasons so hopefully we will start to um, figure that question out and answer that question soon. I, I, I do think part of it is the evergreens. Uh, someone pointed out to me the other day at St. Peter's where we're doing our plantings I've been trying to you know, make a bit of an arboretum there. I just simply, you know, a museum of trees so people can see all the different species we have in Hamilton. And someone pointed out that we do not have enough evergreens. So we're going to get on that this spring. And, and I've got to wonder whether there's a positive effect of being in a conservatory in the middle of the winter time. It may not be as spacious, but you have an immersive green experience. Maybe there's some research to be watched for there. One more question from the audience, perhaps, and then we'll see if there's anything from the chat with Ali. Oh, my heavens, this is the chatty row. Um, <laughs> actually, uh, I, I, Dr. Lem, I, we, I've been to Vancouver many, many times, and it was ridiculed for, for being from Hamilton, and I was advocating for cycling, et cetera. Uh, is there, because there's, for the master transportation plan, there is a specific city employee that is an advocate and sits on civilian committees, et cetera. Is there anything like that in Hamilton that is, like, so that you have a municipal employee saying, yes, we have to do the, the uh, 330, 300 rule, and is advocating for absolute change within the city. I can tell you that the city has been a great partner as long as we've been doing trees for Hamilton, and they have a new lead in their forestry division. They used to plant 6,000 to 8,000 trees per year in the city. And you know the city trees, by the way, when you see the ones which have the green watering bags on them. And this is an anecdote, but every time, like for example, you may have noticed last summer that the link now has more and more trees on it. And when I see that, I get home, I email the lead person for forestry, and I say, you know, way to go, made, me, made my day. So. The, the, city's, the city's trying, for sure. They're trying to increase their numbers. Um, it does become a, a money thing, for sure. To take out a piece of concrete on a city sidewalk and put a tree into that piece of ground is, I think, $4,000. For the city to plant a tree even in a lawn, because you have to do the maintenance, you know, for, is about $400 per tree. So. You know, there's definitely interest there from the forestry department. I don't know how much money they would need to, to accelerate this. And then, of course, you have trees, you know, ice storms, et cetera. You're losing trees every year. So um, we can all do more from the charities to the city. But um, I think, again, with most of the land being owned by private citizens, there, there does need to be more coming from there. And, and people have tried things like uh, backyard plantings and knocking on doors and do you want a free tree? Uh, you know, people have to be part of that movement. So to answer your question, there is the forestry division and clearly they're working on this. And, and now that this new committee's come along with the two people I mentioned who are stars in this field, I'm optimistic that this gets moved along more. And we have a mayor now who might be more interested than some mayors of the past. I'm going to add that um, the city of Victoria actually last year was, I believe, the first city in Canada to formally adopt 
the 33300 rule in policy. So that was a great thing to see. Vancouver hasn't yet. But I, I, a point I want to make about trying to make this happen is, again, using that health frame. We know that our healthcare system, healthcare expenditures are a huge, probably the proportionally, maybe possibly the biggest part of many provincial budgets. And so we, if we can bring those numbers to decision makers about how planting more trees, including more green space in our cities will improve people's health in material ways and reduce healthcare expenditures, um, and we can show them those numbers, I think that could be a really compelling way to get them to support more green infrastructure and more trees because that health rationale hasn't necessarily been used as often. And um, there is evidence showing that doctors and nurses are essentially, they come out at the top of most trusted professionals in the world time after time in global surveys. So if more physicians, more leaders like Dr. Sargent um, and his colleagues at Trees for Hamilton could make that case to the city, I think that would be really powerful. Not sure if you've, you've tried to do that. I'm sure you've tried to do that, Dr. Sargent, um, to present that health rationale. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just also thinking, you know, every argument we can make about doing things like planting trees, they all add up. Another great one for people who may not quite get it, is if they like to see birds around their houses, if they want to hear birds in the morning, but you can get bird seed or you can plant a native oak because the biodiversity that the oak provides is what the birds need rather than seed. So, interesting thing. So I'm wondering if we've got, uh, Ali, have we got a, uh, some chat you could contribute? We absolutely do. Um, so this is in relation to park prescriptions. Uh, Mary online, when I think of nature, I think of untreated, unmanaged land. Since nature is managed under your definition, you're talking a lot about trees. Would nature apply to agricultural time spent on the farm or in rural areas working in the fields or with animals? I'm going to answer by saying, by pointing to that study on cortisol, which had people self-define nature experiences, and they saw those health benefits when they felt like they had a meaningful experience in nature. There actually is a huge body of evidence, well, not quite as big about the evidence about spending time in nature, but there's a pretty significant body of evidence behind the health benefits of gardening, of getting your hands in the soil, of being exposed to those healthy bacteria and watching something grow. Um, there definitely are health benefits related to that. So I would say if you enjoy farming, um, like Dr. Sargent has learned how to do with his amazing arboretum, um, if you enjoy getting your hands in the dirt, that can be a really effective way to connect to nature and do something and watch something grow at the same time. Um, it's a great family activity too. My son uh, at his school every year in every grade, he's actually planted seeds every spring and, and brought little seedlings home and little vegetable plants home and vegetables from the garden. So I think it's a great way to connect families um, and people of all ages to nature. Another question online. Are we currently doing any research programs on forest therapy like in Japan? Great question. So in fact, I'm actually um, a supervisor of a doctoral student at the, uh, I'm on, their, on, on her supervisory committee. She's looking at the effects of forest bathing. Um, so she's a trained nature and forest therapy guide, in fact, on health outcomes. So there is research emerging in this space. I know, again, UBC Forestry is doing some of that work. And I know we have colleagues in, um, in Korea, in China, in Japan, looking into these outcomes. But um, I think one of the really interesting things about nature therapy, and there really isn't a ton of evidence yet, a ton of uh, study behind the actual practice, but it's a very defined sequence that you lead uh, participants through, through invitations. There's a, anyway, it's, it's very easy to standardize the experience. So um, when my student actually completes her, her doctoral thesis, and, and uh, publishes her dissertation, I think we'll have a bit more information. But this is something that is starting to emerge, but not really fleshed out in the research yet. Great. I, I'm, oh. I'm kind of a Greta Thunberg uh, fan, and she would say, I mean, no offense to anybody, I, I do research myself, but she would say, we've done enough research, we just need to get out there and do these things. So a couple of questions relate to each other. I'll just kind of summarize all of them. And it's to both of our presenters. Um, another barrier we foresee is people who experience 
physical disability in natural spaces. How might this prescription work for these individuals? And or how do we make nature more accessible to our senior citizens? Well, I suppose that's something we're doing, Trees for Hamilton. I just showed you one long-term care facility that we planted at. We planted at a few over the years, and we will be doing more in partnership with some of the long-term care leads in Hamilton. Uh, of course, you need to have a partner that wants to, to play ball with you, but we uh, certainly put it out there to all the medical directors and, and directors of facilities that we are happy to plant there. So, that, I mean, that's a you know, a healthcare facility uh, viewpoint. And then again, with getting more trees downtown Hamilton, then you are getting them to all kinds of people. So again, just the whole idea of uh, bringing forest to the patient or bringing forest to the community. So that, that's my take on it. That's a great take. What I wanna add is that in fact, nature prescriptions are lower barrier, I would suggest than exercise prescriptions. So again, there's that question of what gives you the benefit when you spend time in nature is because you're active. And in fact, there's a lot of research showing that just sitting for 15 minutes in nature and looking at nature compared to an urban landscape can measurably improve your cortisol and blood pressure and heart rate variability. So um, I think in fact, if we can organize to get people outside, to get them into green spaces and just have people sit, they don't even have to move we'll see some of those benefits. And I know there are different organizations that work on trying to connect people with more barriers um, to nature. For example, the, uh, the BC Parks Foundation um, has partnered with a number of different organizations within Vancouver um, and kind of the, the lower mainland to bring people who don't necessarily get to experience nature that much out into nature, like new Canadians, um, like at-risk youth with mental health issues like um, women, for example, living in shelters. So I think there are so many different ways that we can connect new populations to nature. We just have to be creative about it and we have to start seeking them out and also realize that you don't have to move necessarily to, be, to get those health benefits. Of course, it's better when you move, but that's not the be all and end all of it. Just get outside, like Dr. Sargent said. Okay, thanks. Uh, have we got any other questions in the audience here? Uh, a couple more here, and again, I'm noting that we're getting close to nine, so uh, perhaps just the last two, and then we'll thank everybody and have a great night. Please go ahead. Hello, thank you. You mentioned in Hamilton that uh, we have a new mayor, who I'm very excited about. I live on the West Mountain, and I wonder why there's such an aggressive tree trimming program going on in Hamilton. Uh, I've lived there over 30 years. They're taking away our canopy every day, and Hamilton is paying them to do it. I took a walk along the Mountain Brow on Monday, and not only on, um, on the West Streets, the West 30, 40, uh, West 35th Streets, not only are they taking away the trees, our canopy that went across the roads, and that I can understand when there's wires involved. But when I walked along the brow the other day, I noticed that they'd hacked off all of our, the branches covering our path. And there are no wires there. And it's very aggressive. And when I got home, I thought, they just took away our shade. That's our shade over our path. So they've made the whole mountain brow, the whole strip along Scenic Drive on the west side of Garth, they've made it very, it will be hot in the summer. So is there any influence one of these tree groups or I could get involved with one to support a tree group to support, it's, it's almost like the city's working against your initiatives in a way. Interesting question. I, I'm surprised by that. In my mind, most of the trimming is either due to utility wires or maybe a diseased tree. It, it costs a lot of money to trim trees, to cut down trees, as you know. So I, I wouldn't think the city is kind of uh, willy-nilly going out chopping branches down. But look, I, I'm afraid I don't, I don't know. And um, 
yes, if you want to help our group, there's many ways you can help. And you can uh, email us. Did I put the email up? Gosh, so many. I have so many emails. What's that email? <laughs> I don't know. You could email me at miles at greenhealthcare.ca. That's that one's easy for me to remember. Dr. Lem, any comments about tree branches in Hamilton? I think I'm a bit out of my depth there. Okay. <laughs> I can, I'm, I'm going to reserve comments on that question. Okay. okay. Hello. Um, my name is Guinevere, and I just want to say thanks so much for this really enriching presentation from you both. Um, I'm a horticultural therapy practitioner, and it's um, a little bit challenging for me to kind of be the sort of solo advocate in the different healthcare settings that I've worked in. And I think that's a bit of a challenge for many of us sort of across the country because um, it's an unregulated profession as of this moment. And so you both spoke so well to the research that makes things a little bit of a no-brainer, so to speak, to really having um, gardening, agriculture, um, nature, both in clinical settings and non-clinical settings to build communal health. And so I was just wondering, um, based on both your personal experiences, if you see a need for there to be trained uh, practitioners that can help facilitate um, the bringing in of nature in, in different sort of spaces or bringing people out to those spaces too, because um, you both have such a pedigree and are a little bit busy. <laughs> and so um, in your respective settings that you work in, would you see that possibly being a benefit? That's my question. Well, the answer for me would be absolutely. So, I just talked about planting trees at the hospitals. We've planted a couple pollinator gardens at uh, St. Peter's Hospital and tried to put them in strategic places so you can see them from indoors and outdoors. Uh, there are vegetable gardens at various places. And so as it stands right now, I always talk about when I do the, the peach talk about we need more champions. There are 650 long-term care facilities and 350 hospitals in, in Ontario, so it's a thousand. To say we need a thousand champions is, I mean, a thousand's not enough. I mean, every facility needs many people taking this on. You know, we don't have money for these sorts of things. So I look at that photo of the Hamilton General so long ago, guaranteed they had a full-time gardener, right? I mean, we don't have that anymore. So, and if there's not money in our system, and I, look, working in this system, the system's tough right now. I mean, unfortunately, we need, we need volunteers stepping up. That doesn't help you in your career, but um, it, it is incredibly important. Yeah. I have to agree with Dr. Sargent. So anything that gets people outside and connected to nature, any, any person, any program, is a net positive for our health. Um, I don't think, as, as we said before, you necessarily need randomized controlled trials to say that any kind of nature therapy is is uh, evidence-based we know the evidence is solid that spending time outside is good for your health and connecting to nature is good for your health so i'm just trying to think of how to how to help you with your career um one concept you could think about is the the overall movement towards social prescribing so this is a, a, a phenomenon where healthcare professionals will in fact prescribe non non-medication um, community kind of community uh, resources to their patients to deal with certain health issues and so nature prescribing is one subset of that but something that social prescribing hinges on is the uh, ability of people to prescribe uh, a community resource via a link worker and so if you look up social prescribing within your community and you see who which organizations might be working on that perhaps connect with those link workers and and make them aware of the services that you offer. They might, and, and also the evidence behind the health benefits of nature, which I think more and more people are becoming aware of, they may just start to link their patients to, to the work that you do. Um, so I would, I would look into that broader phenomenon and, and also the evidence behind nature connection as a way to perhaps expand uh, your audience and people who, who work with you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that question again I think I think in the interest of time we should uh, draw our session to a close I'd like to say a couple of, of concluding remarks if I may and just 
grab my moment here to say so. One of the things that's really struck me in the last hour or two hours is the thread of time that goes through Royal Botanical Gardens and the efforts to improve life in cities, which we see here in abundance in, in a modern vocabulary with science coming behind it. You know, RBG was inspired 100 years ago by Thomas Baker McQuesten and the City Beautiful Movement. And the whole idea then was to beautify cities because it would be a better place for people to live. It would be a healthier place for people to live. Now, maybe the forms they were thinking of 100 years ago was a little different. But I think we, see, we still see this today in the intention. You did, did know that by 1934, the city of Hamilton had more acreage in parks than any other city in Canada. And yet here we've got the Rust Belt, the impression that Hamilton is only heavy industry. Well, there are absolutely areas where this is true and there's so much to do to improve the well-being of people in those spaces. But there is a long thread in Hamilton and it's expressed in the Hamilton Park system, places like Gage Park, uh, the, the, the parks along the Mountain Brow, and Royal Botanical Gardens, which is a descendant of the City of Hamilton Board of Park Management, to have those green spaces available because they make people's lives better. We've got some wonderful examples of that at RBG over the years. Thank you for your point about horticultural therapy. In the 1970s, RBG was teaching horticultural therapy to horticultural therapy teachers. We were the beginning of it in the province of Ontario. Um, and, and we still have, uh, I think until recently, uh, been doing some of that work. Um, things have changed. We're working hard now to continue to connect nature and kids. We have our things like our camps programs, our trails. Uh, we've done groundbreaking work in connecting children and nature uh, and actually fostered the creation of a, a children's outdoor play charter for the province of Ontario a few years ago. Those things are critical to our future, our children's future. Uh, and as I was listening to both uh, Dr. Lim and Dr. Sargent talk about all of the different things that people are experiencing in their lives that are a result of living in the urban cubicles in front of screens, I was teching off a list against my own list of healthcare needs. <laughs> Adult ADHD, Dr. Dr. Lim, it's real. So um, we've got to see if it works, not just ADHD in children. So I, I want to express my profound thanks uh, to Dr. Lem and Dr. Sargent for their energy, ideas, time, and, and generosity in coming together with us this evening. Um, so first of all, please thank you. Join me in thanking them. Thank you. Uh, I want to express my uh, profound thanks to the Colgan family, to Terry, Marsha, and, and everyone who's been involved. Uh, and Patrick Colgan's friends as well, I was a donor to the fund, uh, to uh, keep this series going and growing. Uh, this is the kind of thing that our development department is directly involved with because RBG is a charitable organization. We depend on the help of the, everybody, our members and the, and the, and the public for their, their support. We're doing exciting things. We're looking at expanding accessibility in boardwalks, for example, in the natural areas. We're looking at how we can start uh, enhancing uh, both the protection of nature and the experience in nature at the same time. There are places at RBG where as much as we love people to see it, we've got 50 listed endangered species growing on that map that Miles showed. And it's our legal responsibility to make sure those habitats are protected. So there's a balancing act there. I sometimes get suspicious about the word balance, but there's a balancing act there. It's also very important. Uh, and again, this evening, I would like to express my thanks to our, our technical and organizational team at the back, uh, Tristan and Ali, and, and our, all of our tech support. Thanks, everybody. Uh, and of course, to our audience, uh, to everybody who's here tonight, who everybody's here online at home, uh, I want to wish you a great evening, and I want to hope uh, the weather's nice for you tomorrow and you can get outside. Thank you very much. <laughs>